I want to talk to you today about Jesus and Jesus' success plan. Now, if you came here thinking that I'm going to tell you how to be a millionaire, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not what I'm going to talk about today. But if you were to look in Forbes magazine or some of those other magazines that we read to find out who's who in the world these days, you would find out that there are many millionaires, there are many movers and shakers in the world that are there are doing some wonderful things. They're doing some grand things. But I want to talk to you about Jesus' success plan because his plan was a very high plan. And it was a plan that was, was brought together to, to help us to become who we are becoming right now. You know, we say, well, it doesn't look like much progress has been made, but you know, in reality, a lot of progress has been made over 2,000 years. We have made a lot of progress in our spiritual growth and in the way we treat each other, and there's still work to be done in those areas, but we are in a place right now where there is a spirit our spirit, the spirit of God that is within us that is moving us into ever expanding ways of being. And as we come into these expanded ways of being, there are things going on in our lives that look like a lot of upheaval and a lot of things are changing, a lot of things are going on in us that, that we don't understand and it is our job to begin to look at those things and to say, okay, what is it that we are to release? It's not that we need to add anything. Not one of us needs to add more information about how to be more spiritual, how to do this, how to do that. What we need to do is release those things that are, excuse me, that are not. We need to release that which is not our highest and best. We need to let it go, and we need to say, it is time for us to move forward in our lives. And I mean our entire lives. Our life of spirit, our life of humanity, and we as twofold beings are moving in that direction right now. I believe that we are moving in that direction and that we cannot be stopped. It just can't be stopped. We have to move forward. And yet we say, well, we don't know how. How many of you say that? How many of you say, well, I don't know how. You don't have to know. It's happening. It is happening inside of you right now. You know, Jesus was born of a man. He, he was born to Mary, who at an early age, by the way, was dedicated to God. Her, her parents dedicated her to God at a very early age. So he came into a family, and, and Joseph, uh, who was a devout Jew, he came into a very religious family. He came into a family that really learned, you know, the principles. If you've been dedicated to God, you know that there's something in you that you are to do. And she was given the job of raising this child who was to come to know who he truly was. And so he, he studied. Some people think that uh, maybe he studied in Egypt. Um, some people think Tibet. Um, Others think India. Uh, we do know that he studied in his little village of Nazareth with the local rabbi because that's what young boys did. They studied with the holy person in their city and or their town and, and they, they learned in that way. And so his new understanding grew because you know he, I, I, you know he asked questions. You know those little kids? those really bright ones. He was one of those, and he probably drove his teachers crazy just asking questions. But, but he had a fierce curiosity to know, to truly know. And as he studied, and as he studied the Talmud and the Jewish scriptures and whatever else he studied, we know that he, he began to see some things, some insights into these scriptures that others may not have seen quite so clearly. And as a result of that, um, he, you know, 
he, he, he became a very, very spiritual person. <coughs> and he, he made it his goal to teach, to teach others along the path, the truths that he saw. That became his mission. This was what he was going to do. And he never declared himself to be unique. He never said, look at me, I'm really great. He said, do you not know that ye are gods? And he said things like, the things that I do, you shall do also, and even more than these. Well, we do more than these. We do it today. We've been doing it for a long time. We may do it differently, but we are doing it. One of his success principles was love God. That was his primary, that was his primary focus. If, any, if, if you learn nothing else from Jesus, it was to love God. And Jesus realized that he and the Father were one. And Paul said, Christ in you, your hope of glory. By the way, that was Charles Fillmore's favorite quote. He loved that quote, Christ in you, your hope of glory, that Paul said. And what that's saying to us is, is that our higher self, the Christ, as it is developed, becomes our hope of glory in our own lives. And so when we first put God first in our lives, we are living expressions of that one spirit. All of his life, Jesus had been preparing for that time when he went into the ministry. He'd been preparing all of those years. And when it became time for him, and he knew it was time, he went to his kinsman, John the Baptist, because John was, was uh, preaching, change your mind and you'll change your life. And this went right along with what Jesus was coming to know within himself. And John the Baptist was the, the last prophet of the old dispensation. It, he was the last prophet to come along in the Jewish faith. And he was teaching this and and uh, Jesus knew that this teaching was a bridge for him to move into the next phase of living and for everyone else as well, to realize that our thoughts are important and the things that we say and do are important. He believed that there should be no separation between the two. He didn't come to start a new religion. He didn't come and say, oh, hey, I've got a new religion. It's called Christianity. That didn't happen because Christianity didn't come about until after he was already um, ascended. And so he, he came to really enhance the Jewish religion is what he did and to amplify it so that people understood it in a higher way. And, and uh, that's exactly what uh, Charles Fillmore did when he started Unity. He said he wasn't going to start a new religion. He wanted to just enhance what other people were learning in their religions. And um, after a while, people said, hey, wait a minute, we want a place where we can come and learn these things that you're teaching through your publications. And that's how we became churches. So um, here, you know, Jesus clearly indicated that what he was teaching was not in opposition to the Jewish religion at all but simply expanded their spiritual meanings. And so he began his ministry, and he asked John the Baptist to baptize him. And this water baptism was symbolic of a complete cleansing of consciousness that he felt he needed, a complete spiritual illumination. And as Jesus emerged from the river, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the symbol of a dove. And the voice came saying this announcement of his true identity. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so immediately after the baptism, Jesus would, was led by spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Now, you know, it's been said that it's been, it's different scriptures say different things. Some people say the devil, some people say Satan, 
Um, some actually say the adversary. I like the word adversary because it does not personalize and make this a person who is coming and 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 saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, you can't, I, I'm going to make you change your mind about how you're going to go about this. And we know that this adversary is a part of our own selves. We all have the adversary within us. We all have that adversary that, that comes to us and tempts us with rationalities of why we should do something when we know it really isn't right but we rationalize it and we say, oh, you know, it could be right. It, it, it can be right. And, you know, it would achieve what you want to achieve. And, and basically, this is what the adversary was for Jesus. And um, in that way, uh, Jesus began his time in the wilderness. And he... He prayed, and he fasted, and he meditated, and he was there for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, you all know what 40 days and 40 nights mean. Y'all know what that means? As long as it takes. As long as it takes to achieve what it is you have come to achieve. And so Jesus is there, and he's there as long as it takes. And... There must have been times when Jesus felt undecided, when he needed to pray earnestly before taking any action. Because, you know, there was this deep movement in, in his heart and mind. Um, and there were hundreds of simple and unpretentious actions that he took. But I know that there were times when he was tempted to do something, maybe take a shortcut, maybe to do something just a little differently so that he could accomplish what it was he wanted to accomplish. And perhaps sometimes he would have preferred to take a different path and to not actually take this path, um, but he took the one that was indicated to him as his path. He always took the guidance he was given. He always listened to his inner spirit and he never hesitated to follow this guidance. And Jesus knew this divine potential, but it, he had taken on the limitations of the flesh and a sense man. He was a real man. He wasn't just, you know, a figment of our imagination. He was really, you know, this real spiritual person. He was spiritual, but he was also a human being. And so he knew he had limitations that were going to really test him in his life. And so he decided to come into this sense um, and was, was tempted three different ways by this adversary in the wilderness. And the first temptation was the adversary says to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered in saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, why would he be tempted to do bread, to, to make the stones bread? Well, he'd been fasting. He was hungry by then. <laughs> by the time he got to this place, he was hungry and he thought, you know, there's something in him that says, you know, you've got the power. All you have to do is just to know and this, this, these stones would be bread. But he knows that this is not the way to go. And so he says, you know, it, bread is not important. It is, it is what is inside of a person. The words that come from the mouth of God. The spiritual part of us that is important, that must be preserved. And so he knew the law of mind action. He knew the words were formative, but he would not use them to perform tricks. And when we realize that we are spirit in expression, it gives us the confidence to stand up to our temptations, to stand up. Attainment of a higher consciousness gives us an opportunity to prove that we have accepted and can use the illumination we have received. When we begin to really accept the illumination that is coming into us now, 
we have to be sure that we are going to use it in the right way. One of the reasons Jesus used parables in his, in his um, talks with people was because there were some who were not ready for the truth to be spelled out to them because they were not ready to be able to not misuse what he was teaching. And so it had to be learned gradually and it had to begin to work within the person. We are tested to see if we are disciplined enough to be able to use and to become the master of our thoughts and desires in the development of our Christ mind. And it requires spiritual discernment and unselfish devotion to the highest truth to meet and overcome the temptations of the personal consciousness. For the second temptation, the adversary took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written that he will command his, his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you may well not dash your foot against a stone. He's saying, you know, come on, show your power. Show your power. Show who's on your side. And wow, people are going to throng to you. They're just going to come and they're just going to do everything. And, and you know, you could, you could say to yourself, yeah, yeah, I could reach more people that way if I did this. I could, you know, and I could do more good. And yet, this is not what we are to do. And so Jesus said to him again, it is not written that you put the Lord your God to the test. And in the third temptation, again, the adversary took Jesus on a high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And, and he said to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, this is the humanity part of Jesus that is speaking to him. Remember that. It's not a separate entity out there somewhere. It is that part of ourselves that tests us every day. And Jesus said, Away with you, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the adversary left him, and suddenly angels came and waited upon him. As we can see, all of the things that were offered to Jesus were of worldly concern that could have been used to further his cause. He could have used them all, but he didn't do it. And even though they could help him to the fame that he needed to get his message across, Jesus' focus was on the spiritual. He knew as he remained in the kingdom of God he would be supplied with all he needed. <coughs> Another successful success principle is, of course, following that is seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things will be added unto you. And we certainly see that happening in Jesus' life. We see him always being where he needs to be. We see him always having everything he needs to have. We see that he is able to feed 5,000 people, heal the sick, raise the dead, and he does all of these things without tricks, without using anything that is going to be against his inner spiritual self. To seek first the kingdom is to look within for our connection to where we find all of the things that we are looking for, for everything we're looking for is within each one of us. It's all right here. Divine ideas come to us that help us achieve our goals and our dreams. And so within that spiritual realm that is within us, we have all of the resources we need. After the years of inner preparation, his, bapti his baptism by John the Baptist and his temptations in the wilderness, Jesus was fully equipped to begin his, per his personal ministry. His, um, his service. This, um, and Jesus definitely had a prosperity consciousness because there was never anything that he wanted for. 
He always had everything he needed. His ministry began as a ministry of service. This principle of success is based on love your neighbor. Thus began his healing, teaching, and service ministry. To love our neighbor <coughs> is to know that we are to be certain our dreams benefit all concerned and not just ourselves. You know, sometimes we get so focused on what we want and what our needs are, we forget to think, how is this going to benefit others? How is this going to help others in their quest? And we, we want to love our neighbor to know that we are to be certain our dreams benefit all concerned and not just ourselves. We give more encouragement and we help others and also help them achieve their goals. This next success principle is implied in the same vein as love your neighbor, for it says love your neighbor as yourself. So it's important that we love ourselves, that we take care of ourselves. And when life becomes overwhelming, to take time out for yourself, to spend time in the silence, just find a place to be still for a while. Find a place where you can actually know that the Spirit of God is within you. You know, as we take time for meditation, we are making that connection with our inner self. And this is where all of the good comes from. You know, Spirit is everywhere present. It's everywhere. It's, it's in each one of you. It's in this room. I believe it's in this building, in this world. It's everywhere present. There is no place, we say, where God is not. And so when we are talking about the spirit of God within, we're not being like, whoa, we are really something special, even though we really are something special. But we are not something special that's more special than anything else or anybody else. And this is, this is where we want to make sure that humility comes in and we don't begin to think that we're the beginning and the end of all. So find time to reflect upon your life. Take this time away. Um, look at what is most important to you and give that the time it deserves, <coughs> like your family and your friends. Um, find activities that help you cope with the stress, like play and music and art and exercise and yoga and maybe sports for you. Some people it's running where they actually reach that spot in, you know, where, where it's just like they're in the zone and they're in that. They too are in that, they don't, you don't have to be just sitting with your eyes closed. You can reach that zone in many, many, many ways. And so just take good care of yourself. So how many of these, uh, how can we use these principles in our life? And I say, you know, they're very practical. They're very easy to remember. We all want to be remembered and leave a legacy in our lives, just as Jesus did. You know, we all want to be, um, we never want to forget that we came here with a purpose and a desire to love and to learn. And let us never lose sight of the goal that we were designed for excellence. We were designed to be excellent in our lives, in whatever it is we're doing, whether it's in our, in our work, whether it's in our play, whether it's in our families, we are here to become excellent. Excellent examples because, you know, we are the most excellent expression of who we are in this world. Did you realize that? You are the most excellent expression of you. That's pretty, that's pretty impressive. I like that idea. Throughout his ministry, which was only three short years, in a relatively small area in the Middle East, he made an impact that spread over all the world. He ended his ministry with humility and love as he went to the disgrace of the cross in a final act of trust. And in three days he arose to show that there is no death, 
but that life continues on, a, on another dimension. We need to seek no further for the step to take in achieving harmony and perfection in our own lives. You know, divine mind is already stirring within us. Our part is simply to align heart, mind, hands and feet with the divine. Our part is simply to spend a little time in the silence no matter how we reach that place. Our part is to spend a little thought and a word and, and spend some time following that with action. Without action, nothing that we think is going to amount to a whole lot. It's going to basically live within us. But we must take action and follow the principles and allow God to take care of the rest. For indeed, we are divine. And that divinity that is within you is really working hard right now to get out. And it's coming out. And we see it in each other all of the time. Let's remember to look at ourselves and to see it in ourselves as well. God bless you. And so it is. <laughs>